he comes, here he comes, there's the trumpets, there's the drums, here he comes, hop along Cassidy, here My saddle pal, Red Connors, and I were in Clear Rock to investigate cattle smuggling. Three months ago, the Department of Agriculture closed the border to Mexican cattle after an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease. But Mexican cattle had been found at slaughter pens in the United States. As we passed the court building, I saw my old friend, Judge Edwards. Cassidy. Red. How are you, Judge? Hoppy, you're just the man I want to see. Come on in. So, you can see why I needed a United States Marshal. Here are the extradition papers. You know, I hate to do this because I've always liked the boy. Marco Rodriguez charged with killing a Mexican citizen on Mexican soil. What's his status? He obtained a permit to enter this country several months ago. He's been working as a clerk, saving his money for his education. I see. And who is this Jose Hernandez that signed the complaint? Well, he's a Mexican rancher from across the border. In fact, it was one of his men that Marco killed. Oh, excuse me. Surely. Dorothy, good, good morning. morning. How do you do, John? Judge? I want... Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. I didn't know you were busy. I'll see you later. No, no, don't go. Come on in. I want you to meet a couple friends of mine. The judge introduced Red and me to John Preston and his niece, Dorothy. I knew Preston by reputation. He was one of the wealthiest ranch owners along the border. As a matter of fact, I just stopped by to put up bail for Marco Rodriguez. <laughs> I'm sorry, John, but bail isn't acceptable in this case. But he's innocent. Marco never even carried a gun. It's out of my hands, Dorothy. He'll be extradited to Mexico, and they will try him there. Oh, the... There, there, honey. Maybe it's all for the best. He wasn't good enough for you, anyhow. Oh, you never did like him. But if I can't marry Marco, then I just... I... I wonder if it would do any good for me to talk to this Hernandez. Well, if you could persuade him to drop the charges pending further investigation. I could hold up the extradition. Well, his ranch joins mine below the border. I'll see him as soon as possible. Oh, thanks, Uncle John. <laughs> That's all right, honey. I'm sorry to have interrupted your meeting, gentlemen, with our personal business, but it was nice meeting you anyway. That's quite all right. Say, that's a good-looking sombrero. I don't think I've ever seen one like it. Well, no, I have them made to order. I can see.
see. Well, it's nice to have met you, Mr. Cassidy. Goodbye. Mr. Connor. Dorothy. John. Goodbye, Goodbye Judge. Preston was one of the border ranchers I wanted to question about the cattle smuggling. But I figured our talk could wait till later. I'll see you later then. Thanks. Red and I contacted several other ranchers, but none seemed to know about any cattle smuggling. There was something strange about the way the men were racing their horses. killed yourself with the fall you did off that horse. Who are you? Marco Rodriguez. Those men hold up the jail. Take me with them. I do not wish to go, but they kill me if I refuse. Glad you got one of them. The other two got away. Red, this is Marco Rodriguez. Howdy. Rodriguez? That's right. Is this the Marco the judge is holding in jail that they deport? Was holding. You know who those men were? No, senor. Marco told us he didn't know who the masked men were who had kidnapped him. He insisted they weren't friends of his from Mexico. In fact, he thought they were Americans. We started back with him to Clear Rock. On the way, we heard the whole story. Marco had been riding out to call on Dorothy when he saw some men running cattle through a border fence. When he turned to investigate, several shots rang out. He saw a man fall and rode toward him. Next thing he knew, two riders came up accusing him of murder and insisting he was on the Mexican side of the border. Marco protested he didn't even carry a weapon. But they pointed to a gun in the brush, said he was a liar, and took him to the sheriff. He was almost certain that the two men who took him from the jail were the same two who had ridden up and accused him of murder. He was sure of one thing, though. He had been framed. Marco seemed sincere and honest to me. I could understand why the judge hadn't wanted to deport him and why Dorothy loved him. What's more, I believed he had been framed. Kidnapping a federal prisoner is a serious offense. It certainly is men took quite a chance. But why, Hoppy? I've got a hunch of some connection between Marco's kidnapping and this cattle smuggling. And I'll buy Hoppy's hunches, Judge. So will I. But in the meantime, I cannot accept the responsibility of detaining Marco in this country. Now, here are the extradition papers. I'm sorry, son. You did the best you could, Judge. Gracias. Marco, they can't take you away. They must, Mia Mata. But the judge said, that... can't you wait until I'm my... I'm sorry, miss. Come on, Marco, let's go.
trip to Santa Rosa was delaying my investigation of cattle smuggling. But maybe I'd find some of the answers below the border. I said he's on his way here with a prisoner now. See, si, Senor Hernandez. I want Rodriguez locked up, so there'd be no chance of escape. Oh, you need have no fear of that, Senor. There must be a speedy trial, Sanchez, and a conviction for murder. But, Senor, it is the court who pronounces the sentence and the day of execution. But if you want to stay in Santa Rosa's district attorney, you'll follow my orders. Marco Rodriguez must be tried tomorrow and executed the next day. We had turned Marco over to the Mexican district attorney. Red was wondering what the boy had meant when he warned us to investigate cattle smuggling on this side of the border. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Senor Cassidy. Oh, that's all right. Thanks to you, the boy is safely behind bars. My government is indebted to you. Thank you very much. Red and I are always glad for the chance, though, to visit Santa Rosa. And you are always most welcome, Senor. Thank you. Have you checked uh, Marco's case? It has greatly disturbed me, but the evidence is conclusive. I can do nothing but ask the court for a conviction. Well, you seem pretty sure that he's guilty. It is my duty to prosecute. Of course, the final verdict rests with the court. I knew that verdict would find Marco guilty of murder. I had to act fast to save his life. I'm sorry you are leaving our city so soon, Senor Cassidy. Oh, but we're not leaving. But you already delivered the prisoner. We are also here on a secret government job. And uh, you might be able to help me out, if you will. You need but to ask, senor. Marco Rodriguez gave the United States judge some valuable information about embargoed cattle being smuggled across the border. Cattle smuggling? But I did not know this. Oh, yes. And he might be called for further investigation. Now, you might be able to delay that trial for me, huh? What you ask presents a problem. But I will try to arrange with Judge Carrillo to grant your government's wish. Thank you very kindly. We'll see you later. Adios. has not been here. But he promised me. Well, yeah. My trial is tomorrow. Perhaps he will come then. But we can't wait till tomorrow. I'm getting you out of here now. But that will be too dangerous. It's more dangerous for you to stay here and be convicted. See, si. Perhaps if we can see Jose Hernandez. And convince him you're innocent. The first Mexican rancher I talked with said that Jose Hernandez bought whatever cattle he had for sale. A month ago, he had sold him 50 head. Another man said that he too had been selling his beef to Hernandez. It appeared that all the ranchers around Santa Rosa sold their stock to Hernandez. Our next move was to head for his ranch.
No estoy en casa para los americanos. Sí, señor. Quiero que mis hombres vengan pronto. Uh -huh. Still got a mouthful of words. Careful, they'll choke you. I'd like to see Senor Hernandez. Senor Hernandez is away. Not here. Nobody here. He's away, huh? Mm -hmm. But please, Senor, you shouldn't do Come that. On. that. My boss will scold me. Red, <laughs> say something to him in Spanish, will but you? Senor, please. Why, don't do Buster, it. my partner wants to write a note. But he can't do that. I mean. Uh, Hoppy, I think that darn Hernandez is hiding in there. You do? That servant acted mighty suspicious. He certainly did. Shall we follow them? No, oh, that's the last we'll see of Mr. Cassidy around here. We checked on the rancher. They told him they sold her cattle to you. Yeah, which they did legitimately. He hasn't any proof. Now, well, let's see what he has to say. Mr. Hernandez, when you see John Preston, tell him he left his hat on your desk in the living room. Or was it your hat? Cassidy. We're going after him. But you said... Never mind what I said. Forget what I said. Cassidy knows too much. If we ride hard, we can catch him before he gets to the border. Marco, get inside. Inside. Girl, she tricked me. What girl? The, the, the Americana, Dorothy Preston. They tied me up, took my keys away, and freed Marco. Where do they go, you know? Ah, senor, is muy malo. They go to see Hernandez. Hernandez? Come on. I'll go around the back.
Stephanie's pal and Sanchez are sneaking up on us. I don't see Cassidy. You stay here and keep him covered. I'll keep an eye on Dorothy and Marco. you at home this time. Untie your knees. Come on. What do you mean, forcing your way into my house? The district attorney at Clear Rock wants to ask you a few questions. Well, let's go. Hey, you're in Mexico now, not the United States. You got no authority here, so get out. I'm afraid you're mistaken. I brought Senor Sanchez along with me. Well, I'm glad you did. He's my man, and he'll do exactly what I tell him to do. I don't think so. You forget the position you're in. So do you, Cassidy. Get your hands up. Good work, Becker. Where's Carter? He got hit. Take him outside and finish him. It'll be a pleasure. Get your hands up. I'm all right, Harvey. Yeah, I'm all right. Senor, arrest these two for murder. I want to take them back to the States. With much pleasure, amigo. Get them out of here, Red. Well, I'll be. My own uncle. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Preston and his men were in Clear Rock Jail, while Judge Edwards was busy untangling the Preston Hernandez double life. Murder and cattle smuggling would mean a stiff prison term. Marco was free to marry Dorothy, and Red finally swallowed that mouthful of words and understood about the black sombrero. <laughs> Hi, my young friends. You know, I've had a lot of letters in the last six or eight months about you not wearing your raincoats and your overshoes. Now, the reason you don't see Hoppy in a raincoat and overshoes is that I live in a country where there isn't too much rain. But you must always, when it is raining, wear your raincoats and your overshoes. And there's one more thought, too. Don't leave them at the schoolhouse. Bring them home, will you? I'll see you next week. And be sure and wear those, will you? There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys reign. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. Hop along, Cassidy, so long, Hop. Here he comes, here he comes, there's a trouble.
trumpets and the drums, here he comes. On the long cast saddle tired having been constantly on the move for three days. No rest for me nor for my partner and the horses. The trail had been long and weary, but I knew that Red and I were nearing the end of our destination when we rode into the windy and dusty Mexican village of San Pablo. We were after a killer, Sam Chapman, who had fled across the border after swindling and shooting a friend of ours. We'd never seen Chapman. All we knew was his name and that he had a peculiar crescent-shaped scar on his right cheek. The trail had been hot and cold, but our break came when a sheep herder told us of seeing an Americana with such a scar in San Pablo. I stopped a Mexican, told him I was a U.S. Marshal, and asked where we could find Chapman. But when I described the scar, he looked at me sort of frightened and then scurried away. The same thing happened when I asked a woman. And then again, when I questioned the boy. What do you make of this, Harvey? Huh? You think we had to sever your itch? Well, if you don't quit scratching, I'll think we have. Go over here to the cantina. Maybe there's somebody in there that isn't afraid to talk. What is your pleasure? A little information, if you don't mind. Then you have come to the right place. I, Jose, am the best informed man in all San Pablo. Yeah? Maybe you can tell us where we can find Sam Chapman. Chapman? An Americano? That's right. He has a scar on his face. It's shaped like this. We want to have a talk with him. There is no such man in San Pablo, senor. Wait a minute. Are you sure? Seguro que si, I am sure. Now go back to your country where you belong. Hey, who do you think you're talking? Take it easy, Red. Look out! Now look what you've done. But Harvey, this... Wait a minute. We didn't come here looking for trouble. I'm sorry for what's happened. It is too late to be sorry, senor. You have to shoot, just wing them. Paren esto, immediately. Me oyen? Since when do the men of San Pablo act like ill-bred savages? Put away your knife and go. Thank you, senorita. Who are you men? I'm Hopalong Cassidy, a U.S. Marshal. This is Red Connors, my deputy. You are looking for a man with a scar on his face. Why? Because he's a killer. That's not true. He... Yes? I think you better have a talk with my father. Don Miguel Alvarez, the wealthiest man in San Pablo and Lola's father, admitted knowing an American with a crescent-shaped scar on his right cheek. But his name wasn't Chapman. It was Forrester, Jim Forrester. True, Senor Cassidy. It is true that he's also wanted by the American authorities. Also my foot. He's the man we're after. No, no, Senor. Of that I'm certain. Sit down, please. Thank you. Senor Forrester first came to San Pablo about two months ago. He was found on the street, exhausted and feverish. He was delirious, and he talked about being a wanted man. Everyone in San Pablo knows this. But as he recovered his health, the people took him to their hearts. Not only do they come to him with their troubles, but already, through his knowledge of medicine, 
He has saved the lives of many. Then he's a doctor? Not exactly. But now you can understand why the people acted like they did. They would give their very lives for him. He's quite a man. Yet he's wanted by the law. Why? I think he should tell you that himself. I'll send for him. You'll excuse me, please. Surely. I did my best for the patient, but he died. They accused me of malpractice. I hadn't yet received my doctor's degree. And so they issued a warrant for my arrest. And then I fled across the border. It's not a very nice picture, is it, gentlemen? Senor Forrester! Senor Forrester! El niño está muy malo. Venga pronto, por favor. Si, si. No tenga miedo. Excuse me, gentlemen. I'm going with you. Her little son was taken suddenly ill. Oh, I see. Well, senor, are you convinced he's not the man you seek? Ah, it looks that way. Well, it's been a pleasure. The pleasure is mine. But you mustn't think of leaving yet. There will be a fiesta the day after tomorrow when we honor the patron saint of San Pablo. You stay as my guest and join in the celebration. A fiesta? So we could do it with a little fun. I guess we could at that, Red. Thank you very much. Then come. I'll show you where to stay with your horses. I hadn't planned on leaving San Pablo yet, and Don Miguel's invitation fitted in nicely with what I had in mind, to check up a little further on the man who called himself Forrester. Maybe he was Forrester. Maybe it was coincidental that he and Chapman had identical scars. Maybe. But I wasn't sold. And what happened the next day while Red and I were riding to town convinced me that I wasn't just daydreaming. to suspect the two riders heading up the road. They waved a friendly hand as they passed us. But something in the way they averted their heads caused me to glance back at them. they weren't Mexicans? Yeah. What do you make of it? I think Chapman sent them out here to get rid of us. Chapman? Yeah, or maybe I should say Forrester. Forrester? Well, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't on the face of it. Well, well if Forrester's Chapman, what's he doing in San Pablo? He's got a reason. I'm just as sure of that as I am that he's our man. Come on, let's go. The streets of San Pablo were transformed into scenes of rejoicing and celebrating, all in honor of their patron saint. Soon they would be dancing, singing, and playing their instruments as if it would be their last chance of a lifetime. Red had never seen anything like this.
Many came from outer communities. All work stopped. The poor revelers mixed with the townspeople in the marketplace. Don Miguel told me no fiesta would be complete without contest for the young men. Skilled horsemen pitting their skill and muscles against the bulls. A contestant had to rope the animal by its feet and then ride it. From the untamed mountain regions came the various bands. Each had their own way of paying homage to the patron saint. Their dances were handed down over the years. The weird turns and jumps hadn't changed. Only the meaning was different. Now they were no longer worshiping a sun god, fire, a tree, or a rock. who wouldn't go in for the riding and roping contest, Don Miguel arranged to give the best dancers cash prizes. Everyone seemed determined to win first money. These dancers were not interested in prizes. They swayed back and forth in rhythm with the music, giving out messages and a meaning for their people. A message of prayers and hopes for good crops in the coming year, just as it had been in the past. darkness came, Don Miguel's hacienda was alive with friends. His party was the climax of the first day's festivities. The following morning, all the excitement had left the hacienda. Servants, children, and guests went into town for the religious procession. Then one of the servants told us Don Miguel wanted to show us something in the family shrine. The shrine was a small windowless room with thick walls and a bolted door. I can't explain it, but as I looked around, I felt a sudden sense of peace. And I could see that Red, too, was affected by the same feeling.
includes an image of a patron saint carved from a solid piece of emerald. It has been in the family for centuries. It is believed to have strange powers. Strange powers? Yes, of healing the mind. And it's recorded in our family Bible that two men and a woman saw it come to life. Happened in Spain many years ago. Gee, Josephat, that must be worth millions. It's priceless, my friend. A sacred heirloom. Only once a year is this shrine entered to remove the image so it can play its part in the fiesta processional. A bell suddenly rang in my head and I knew why the man who called himself Forrester had remained in San Pablo. He had heard of the Emerald Saint and the door that was opened only once a year. But before I could say anything... Don't move. Anyone. What's the meaning of this in your Forrester? His name isn't Forrester, it's Chapman. And he's after this Emerald Saint. You're right, Cassidy. I'm sorry, my friends, but I've waited a long time for this day. Surely you don't think I've hung around this boring town because I liked it, or just a doctor, you're poor. No, don't. Don't take the image, I beg you. If it's money you want, I'll give you 50,000 pesos. I promise. You're very generous, Don Miguel. But I think this image, when cut up, will bring close to a half a million dollars. You would cut it up? Desecrate our patron saint? I'm sorry, senorita, but I cannot afford to be sentimental. You will be punished for this, swifter than you think. I warn I you. I have been warned before, senorita. And now, with your very kind permission, my friends and I will leave you. You'll never open it. There's a heavy bolt on the outside. Well, we can try it. Step back, please. Way back. Trailing him this time wasn't so easy because he knew we would follow. He tried every trick in the book. He ducked back across the border. In a way, I was glad of that, for on our soil, I had full authority. We spotted their horses near a cabin. Chapman. It 
would seem that I underestimated you, Cassidy. How did you get out? Where's your other friend? Don't turn around. Well, well. The tables are turned again. Tie them up. Taking the image back to Don Miguel. You're doing what? Taking it back. And leave Wilkes and me empty handed? Not on your life. You promised an equal split when you sent for us, and I'm going to get mine if Why I. Why don't you be quiet? You annoy me. I forgot about Cassidy and his pal. Go back in there and finish him. returned the Emerald Saint to Don Miguel, handed over our prisoners to the nearest sheriff, and we were now heading back home. But as we rode along, I couldn't help wondering what it was that Chapman saw and heard. Hi there, little partners. I think you know your mummy is the nicest and the most beautiful woman in the world, and that she loves you very dearly. So when she asks you to do anything, don't fuss about it. Just do it. For instance, when she asks you to have a glass of milk, drink it. And then surprise her by asking for another one. You try that and see how much better you both feel. Now, until next week, so long. And in the meantime, watch yourself at the crosswalks, will you? Hop along, Cassidy. Hop 
Avalon Cassidy, he'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. Hop along Cassidy, so long hop. Here he comes, here he comes. There's the trumpets, there's the drums, here he comes. Hop along Cassidy. Connors and I had ridden the 50 miles from the town of Twin Rivers to attend the funeral of my old friend Clem Watson, sheriff of Pima County. Clem's death had come as the climax of a strange series of bank burglaries in the surrounding counties, each spaced exactly a month apart. And in each case, the method of operation would be the same. An elderly woman would come into the bank to open an account. That night, someone would break into the bank, manipulate the combination of the safe, and make off with its contents. But not until the robbery of the bank in Pima City had the old lady been connected with the burglaries. Two days ago, the banker there advised the woman on some investments. That evening, returning to his office to take care of some unfinished work, Clem Watson and his deputy answered the call for help on the run. Clem died instantly with a bullet through his heart. By the time the deputy regained consciousness and a posse could be formed, it was too late to do any good. The empty buckboard had been found in a canyon a few miles out of town, and a thorough search of the surrounding countryside failed to reveal the slightest trace of the old woman or her companion. The banker thought it unlikely the case would ever be solved, that I didn't intend to give up so easily. Clem Watson had been too good a friend of mine to let his murderer go unpunished. But without a trail to follow, it was a puzzler. Then a thought struck me. Each robbery had been closer and closer to home. And since Twin Rivers was the nearest town to Pima City, it was logical that our bank might be next. Got the answer, Hoppy? I don't know, Red. Just a hunch. Let's go. Oh, Mr. Vig, we've had a series of robberies now all over the state in the last month. We haven't too much to go on, but we think it's an old lady. So if any old lady should come in here and want to have a talk with you, you'll be sure and let me know, will you? You bet I will. But I'd like to see anybody figure off the combination on that safe. <laughs> mm, it looks like a new one. It is. It came from Boston. I bought it when the Cattlemen Association started making such large deposits with me. I see. Well, nevertheless, you keep your eyes open. This woman's a pretty smart operator. I used to be pretty good at these things. Careful, you might leave fingerprints. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was only kidding. <laughs> we'll check with you later. All right. So long. So long. Hi, lawman. Have time to say hello, Hoppy? Well, hi there. Hello, Harry. Hello, Hoppy. Nice to see you. How are you, Dad? Good. When did you get back from Santa Fe? Last night. And, Hoppy, we have the most wonderful news. 
The doctor there said that Harry was strong enough to go back east for another operation. The one we hope will give him back full use of his legs again. We expect to leave by the end of the week. Ah, oh, that is good news. And it was good news, for in the five months that had passed since the wealthy Adele Keller had brought her accident-crippled husband out from the east and had taken a house out in the nearby hills where he could regain his strength, we had all come to like and admire her. Not only for her devotion to her husband, but for her kindness and charity to everyone in the neighborhood. Well, we'd better be on our way. I'll give you a hand here, Harry. Oh, thank you, Harry. Oh, Brad. You could save me the trouble of going out of my way if you take these groceries out to Mrs. Pagel's place. Poor dear, she's had a hard time since she lost her husband. You're not going to trust Red to deliver food, are you? Now, Red, no nibbling on the way. Not even one of these fig Newtons? Not even one. But I tell you what I'll do. How about you and Hoppy coming to dinner tomorrow night? What about tonight? Well, um... Red, it's a long drive from Santa Fe. Give the lady a chance to catch her breath. Yeah, well, I'll be holding mine till I eat some of Miss Adele's fried chicken. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> now, Red, don't you burst until tomorrow night. It's about six. Just let me help. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Red, how careless can you be? Oh, I didn't mean to squeeze your hands so hard. I guess you don't know your own strength. Until tomorrow night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, go on and deliver your groceries. Where are you going? Back to the office. I got a lot of work to do. I had worked far into the night trying to find a police circular I remembered seeing a long time ago. At last, I found what I'd been looking for. Red. Hey. Hey, look at this. What is it? Take a look at this. It's a wanted circular put out by the Chicago Police Department about four years ago. Wanted for bank burglary. Frank Ballard, age 50, height five feet, four and a half inches. He has smooth, fair complexion and talks in a high-pitched voice. His mo... Mo does... Oper... Oper... <laughs> operandi. When'd that foreigner get in there? Modus operandi, that's big city police talk for method of operation. Well, why didn't they say so in the first place? Read on. His modus operandi is to use a pretext to look over a small town bank, then to return at night and learn the combination of the safe by feeling the clicks of the tumblers with his fingertips, which he sandpapers to the quick. Hey, that's a pretty slick one, that is. That must be how that safe in the bank at Pima City was opened. Oh, you're barking up a wrong tree there, Hoppy. That was a woman. Now, wait a minute. Ballard's description says he's a small man with a high-pitched voice. He could have passed himself off as an old lady. Maybe that's how he threw everybody off the track when he changed back into men's clothes. Say, maybe you got something there. Uh, maybe and maybe not. But nevertheless, I'm going to send a telegram to the Chicago Police Department. I want all the information on Frank Ballard I can get. I'll be right back. At 9 o'clock the next morning, I received the answer to my telegram. All it said was, Frank Ballard died in Illinois State Prison two years ago. That let Ballard out as far as I was concerned. Cassidy! Cassidy, come here, quick! Come here! It's happened. What's happened? Come inside, look for yourself. Come on. This way, when I opened the bank this morning, they got away with over twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, that's what you get for not letting Hoppy me know as soon as the old lady got in here. There wasn't any old lady. There wasn't a stranger in the place all day yesterday. Hoppy, that's, that's a different mode, mo modus modus operandi. I'd say it was the same. Modus operandi. What's this idiot trying to say? Why, that city talk for how the burglars did it. I don't care how they did it. I want to know who did it. If I don't get this money back, I'm a ruined man. Mr. Biggs, I have a much better reason than that for getting these burglars. Come on, let's see if they left any trail in the alley. So far, the pattern was the same, even to the Jimmy Breer door. 
And as usual, they had erased their footprints. They had left no trail. We're stuck, Harvey. What's the next move? We're going to round up every stranger in this community for questioning. We spent the day questioning every dubious character we could find. But in every case, they either didn't fit the description or they had perfect alibis. All right, you two can get out of here. Well, what do we do now? Too late to do anything now, but the first thing in the morning, we're going to head south and warn that bank at Mesa Verde. If the old lady hadn't been there first, you mean? If she has, we're going to put a guard in every bank in the state. Now, oh, come on, we're due out at the Kellers. Hey, at least we won't leave in the morning hungry. <laughs> yeah, dell has been simply wonderful. Nothing's been too much trouble for her. Oh, never mind that now, Harry. Come on, everybody, dinner's ready. Ooh. Let me give you a hand, Mr. Keller. Oh, thanks, Red. I can make it. Red. You're getting clumsier every day. Now, where have I seen that face before? Well, it does look a little like Ed Casey, but not very much. Uh, of course, that's not very flattering. Ed Casey was a, a bartender that left town owing Red ten dollars. Yeah, yeah. I could have sworn that was Ed's picture. Come and get it. Poppy, you sit there, and Red right here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Red. Red. Well, I was just passing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have, roll, Red. have all you want, Hoppy. There's plenty more. Thank you. We heard there was a holdup at the bank last night. Was anyone hurt? Ah, oh, fortunately not. It wasn't exactly a holdup. It was a burglary. More than likely, the same old woman did them other jobs. An old woman bank robber? Why, that's preposterous, Red. Oh, it ain't so pre... It, it, it ain't so preposterous. Well, what do you think, Hoppy? I think Red's been reading too many detective stories. When do you figure on leaving for the East, hey? Well, Hoppy... Day uh, after tomorrow. We're driving into town in the morning to telegraph a reservation. I hate to see you go, Mr. Dale. Sure gonna miss your fried chicken. Well, we'll miss you too, Red. Why don't you have some more? Don't mind if I do. You know, this gun belt seems a little tighter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for the dinner. We were glad to have you, Hoppy. Good night to you. Have a good night, Hoppy. Good night. Good night, Red. Good night. Hey, Hoppy. Good evening to you. Their picture didn't look any more like Ed Casey than a mountain goat looks like a shorthorn steer. I know that, and you know it, but Adele and Harry don't know it. Would you please tell me what this is all about? I'll explain it to you on the way into town. Adele's sore fingertips, I had noticed at dinner, the fact that they had been away every time a bank had been burglarized, and the picture we had seen in their home certainly pointed the finger to Adele and Harry. That looks just like the fella in the other picture. I'm sure it's the same man. Well, let's take some handcuffs and go out there and bring them in. Oh, we've got a circumstantial evidence. I can't accuse them of anything until I've got some proof. search their house. You stay here and keep an eye on them. I want a full report on every move they make just in case I don't find what I'm looking for.
I made the reservation. We pull out of here tomorrow. I wish it were today. Calm down. You've been jittery ever since last night. Oh, I can't help it. That crack red made about the old woman has me thinking that Cassidy's close to the truth. Ah, forget it. If Cassidy had anything on us, he'd have made a move by this time. Where are you going? If I can get red alone, I'm going to get some information out of him. business. Oh, I just came by to... I just came to tell you and Hoppy that Harry and I have made train reservations. We're leaving today instead of tomorrow. So if we don't see Hoppy again, tell him goodbye for us. Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye, Red. Goodbye, Miss Adele. in trouble. Cassidy's closing in on us. What makes you think so? There was a file of wanted circulars on Cassidy's desk. And it was open to Dad's picture. We gotta get out of here fast. We'll pick up our money and head for the border. Let's go. made a search of the living room, the bedrooms, and the kitchen. I had turned up nothing that would confirm my suspicions. But in the corner of the cellar... Up the whole works. Yeah, but where's the old lady? She'll be along soon enough. We'll go out and hide our horses and let them walk right into our trap. Get your hands up, Cassidy. You too, Red. Get their guns, Adele. Now go downstairs and see if you can find some rope to tie them up with. Keep them up. All right, downstairs, you two. You were too smart for your own good, Cassidy. Or your big mouth friend was too dumb. What did I do? You tipped me off when you made that crack about someone pretending to be an old woman. And when I saw the Frank Ballard wanted circular on Cassidy's desk, I was sure he was tying me up with the deal. Uh, so the old coot was your pop, huh? Never mind the talk. You get the suitcases out to the buckboard while I set the place on fire. So that's the way it's gonna be, huh? 
Why don't you just shoot us and get it over with? Have your friends hounding us when they find your bodies? Oh, no. This way, it'll look like you were trying to put out a fire and got trapped. Nice people. Sour next to yours, Cassidy. Keller had done a good job with the ropes, and now I could smell the coal oil he was sprinkling around the kitchen, and I could hear the crackle of flames as tinder dry wood caught fire. This old place will go up like a furnace. Don't give up, Red. Just keep working. It's getting awful hot, Hoppy. Looks like we're goners. Oh, you'll make it. Hey. Knife with a spring blade in the left pocket. Can you get to it? Now ah, try it. Get a little closer. You didn't got it. Oh, I can't get it off my wrist, but there I got it. Ah. Watch your hand. Not that way, Red. You'll never make it. Stand back there. Stand back. Come on, out the window. You go first. No, come on. The cellar ceiling goes all in. Come on. The tracks of Adele's buckboard left an easily red trail. Tex, let me have your gun. I'm after a couple of bank robbers. Adele's team had plenty of speed. It was some time before we caught sight of them. Like a lot of others, Adele and Harry thought they were smarter than the law. And now they'd spend the rest of their lives in the New Mexico State Prison, learning the hard way that crime never pays. Hi, little partners. Have you been doing anything to help Mom around the house lately? You haven't. Let's do all we can to help her, huh? I bet you'll have fun doing it, and I know Mom will appreciate it. 
Will you do that for me? Not till next week, so long, and good luck. There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys raised. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then.